Welcome to the Linguava Podcast, The Invisible Profession, where we give you tools, tips, and resources in medical interpretation and translation that help bring to life our industry and ultimately help improve health outcomes for the limited English proficient communities. Welcome everyone to podcast episode number 13. Really excited today to have our our special guest, Ileana Lobo, joining us today from Tacoma, Washington. And uh, Ileana has an incredible, incredible bio. If you don't know her already, Ileana is a certified healthcare interpreter and also a Washington State authorized medical interpreter. She's a certified trainer of trainers of medical interpreters. She holds two masters from Brown University in bilingual education and Portuguese and Brazilian studies and started out as a Spanish Portuguese medical interpreter all the way from Rhode Island. So Ileana, welcome to the show today. Glad to have you here. So glad you invited me to be with you today. I'm very happy to be here. Hi, everybody. And to my Brazilian friends. Oi, galera, tudo bem? <laughs> excellent, excellent, Ileana. And, and just for us to get a little bit more of a, of a backstory, we'd, I'd love to hear, hear from you just in regards to how did you get first started uh, as, as an interpreter? Well, you know, I think I share what a lot of older interpreters may share in that I was the youngest member of the family of immigrants, so my English was the best, and I ended up interpreting for my grandmother um, when I was in fourth grade, and she came to the U.S. in a wheelchair, and when we moved back to Brazil, she was walking and doing yoga as a result of multiple surgeries that she has had had. But I'm the one who went with her to all of her referrals and was with her at the hospital and, and doing physical therapy with her. So I want to I want to pivot briefly into the what we're going through right now, the pandemic and the public health crisis that we're experiencing, uh, which brings us now today where we have the vaccine here and, and we're in, in group one. And I saw just the other day on, on LinkedIn that. You got your first your first round, so <laughs> congratulations, and you're still here. So that's so that's wonderful. Oh yeah, uh, tetanus shot is much worse. It, le- it leaves your arm a lot more sore, or at least for me, I've had no after effects. A little okay. bit of soreness. It's the next day, but you know, nothing like getting a tetanus shot before going to summer camp. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that, that's true. And I know a lot of a lot of interpreters are, are asking, you know, questions about. How 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 to get it? You know, some, some hospitals are are providing for, for interpreters right now. Some um, maybe not quite yet. Um, can you walk, just walk us through real quick, sort of what was sure. that and experience like for you? Getting getting this experience would be valuable to share because I am no longer on staff at a hospital or medical center, right. so right. I am working still. Because if I'm going to be a trainer, I still have to be taking assignments as an interpreter. So then I know the status quo of what's happening today and how people are being treated today and what kinds of patient populations are coming in today. So I still work. I still take assignments in public health as a healthcare interpreter, but I'm an independent contractor, sole proprietor now. And so are a lot of interpreters out there. And I don't want you to think that you're being left out in the cold because all I did was call my doctor, my clinic and say, I want to make an appointment. Why do you need an appointment? Because I want to find out how to get on the list to get a vaccine because I work as a healthcare interpreter. That's all I said to reception. And she's like, oh, well, you don't have to. I mean, you can certainly have an appointment if you want one with your doctor, but as a healthcare worker, she just segued right into that without my having to argue it. Um, this is the number you call. And I called. And yes, I waited 37 minutes before someone answered on hold. Yeah. So be patient, people. If there's yeah. something you can yeah. do, sitting down, pay some bills. Yeah. Just keep that call on hold until you get through. Because when I told the receptionist, Hey, I've been waiting for 37 minutes. Is that usual? She goes, Oh, that's a lot better. It was over 60 minutes last week. Oh, wow. 
So right, I can that's, imagine that's how hard it is for them getting all these irritated people who've been waiting forever, but it's yeah. worth the wait. So be willing to wait out that whole period and get through to the referral number given to you by your, your healthcare provider. I didn't even have to wait to get to my doctor. My receptionist at the clinic where I see my doctor had the information. Now, I don't know if it's going to be different in different states, depending on whether they view healthcare interpreters as part of the healthcare team. Mm-hmm. But I and think you, and you just you say, I'm a healthcare coma. interpreter, I work in healthcare, and that's going to resonate. Yeah. And you should be able to get a referral to yeah. make your point. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm hearing yeah, a lot of most of the large hospitals, at least, you know, in the Portland uh, area are are following following that similar similar protocol. Did you get yours in Tacoma, Washington? Yes, I did. And if you work for a big agency, I don't know if the agencies are participating in some places they are, some places they aren't. I was just able to go directly and I would suggest you try that first. And then if no joy or if it's taking too long, go to the big agency in your area and see if they have a connection to get their team of independent contractors immunized. Yeah, that's one of the things we've we've been doing as well at, at, at Linguava is, is talking to all of the language access managers at each each hospital and and asking them what's the what's the plan and what's the best best uh, process and, and way in which our freelance interpreters can can get the access. Um, when and most hospitals have have that have that plan that they've been able to share, which we've been able to share with all all interpreters as as well. So that's that's uh, that's awesome that that you, that you got it, and then you'll be getting round round two in in, in a few weeks. February second, I believe. And did you get a date when you were getting the first one? Did they give you? You're a not date? allowed to leave. You have to sit okay. for 15 minutes after you get the shot to make sure you don't develop any side effects, and you're not allowed to leave, at least here, until the second appointment is booked. So really okay. efficient. They even have. Hang on, just a second. And you leave with your little card. Yep. Yep. Get filled out again and we'll be able to travel again i can't wait <laughs> oh that's, that's exciting and, and as far as you said as far as you know pain very very little side effects really not noticeable um i had nothing yesterday this morning i noticed as i was washing my hair a little bit of tenderness but like i said tetanus shots that i've gotten in the past hurt a lot more it felt like i had a golf ball embedded in my arm yeah. or something really this well, is nothing like that. Yeah, no, that's that's good. Uh, it was one of the things you know I I think about when we're when we're talking about the the vaccine. Where my mind goes is I, I'm thinking about the limited English proficient community, and I'm thinking about the the deaf and hard of hearing community. There's so much information out right now, um, you know, on 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 TV, on internet. You know, there's con- every day. You know, you you could read a different story depending on where where you go in regards to what's available, what are the risks, how do you get the vaccine, all those questions that we're, you know, we've all asked ourselves too. So I think about how is that information being disseminated to, to those who maybe are limited English proficient or um, the deaf and hard of hearing community. So my, my question for you would be, what, what advice would you give to the hospitals in regards to providing meaningful language access during this public health crisis? What should they be taking into consideration to ensure that that's happening? Well, I would hope they would have a patient family education committee somewhere within the hospital because that's re- this is right in their wheelhouse. Mm-hmm. How do I get the information out? How do I make sure that the phone tree isn't only in English? How do I make sure I have translations? How do I pressure the pharmaceutical companies who have big budgets to roll out directions that have already been translated? And how do we come together so that each and every hospital isn't spending money to translate the same directions? Why can't we pool that resource? So I'm gonna recommend two resources on opposite coasts. the group that's called FOCIS, F-O-C-I-S, out of Massachusetts. And I'm sorry that I don't know what the acronym stands for. Acronyms are the bane of my existence. I know, right? 
<laughs> but follow. I would get in touch with someone at Cambridge Health Alliance, like Vanessa Costa, and get the link to the focus uh, translated materials around the immunization and around coronavirus in general, if you're on the East Coast, because that language group reflect, reflects the higher demand languages that are more East Coast in nature. And then here in Washington State, we have a great group called WASCLA, the Washington State Coalition for Language Access, that put yep. together uh, translations of very good quality for the same thing, immunizations and coronavirus. And that organization is run very uh, by a very able and dear person, Joanna Ramos. And if you put in WASCLA, F-W-A-S-C-L-A in Google, you'll find it. Yeah. And again, those translations reflect the languages that predominate more on the West Coast. And it's not going to cover everything, yeah. but it's a place where you can at least get that reliable information for the highest demand languages and then do what you can within your organization and your patient family education, outreach, communications, uh, resource library. Yeah. It falls under you know, into different buckets in different places. This is usually a place where family can come and learn more about an inpatient's condition and where sometimes they have classes. And I would go there and see what they are collecting um, on this topic because yeah. that's, that's their job description. Yeah, no, no, that's, that, that's excellent. Um, thanks for sharing that too. And when you've been interpreting during, um, during COVID, what what have you what have you seen that the that the patients you're you're interpreting for what are what are they experiencing that might be might be might be different you know during during this time and what should we as interpreters be aware of or even healthcare providers be be aware of um, when we're servicing um, the LEP community during this time? Well, the most obvious is the pivot to telehealth. Um, Many more appointments are being done remotely than used to be. And the challenge there is getting the patient and their family to understand how to access the platform and manage the platform. But I do interpret quite a bit for Children's Hospital here in Seattle. And the concern there and, and still um, in person, although far less frequently this year than in the past, um, and the concern there has always been they'll take your temperature at the door and check to see if you've been symptomatic of cough or fever or anything before they let you in as a routine over the years. So that hasn't changed as much there as it has in other places where you'll be met by a medical assistant or something at the entrance to the clinic and given a mask if you don't already have one or asked to swap a mask if you're wearing a gaiter or one of those less efficient forms and your temperature will be taken before you're let in for an appointment. Um, so all this extraneous technological stuff yeah. does dilute a little bit and, and does take away some of the focus. People are flustered. Um, and I think it's mo more important than ever for interpreters to still uphold the standard, you can often be connected and people are already halfway through changing the dressing or whatever it is that is going to happen there today. It's hard to get that pre-session in, but you can do it in three sentences and you can rattle it off very quickly by saying, hi, I'm Eliana, your Portuguese English interpreter. So reading, name, language check, right? Mm -hmm. Please speak directly to each other in first person and know that I'll interpret everything and keep it confidential. Whoa, we got first person directly oh, to each other, you know. confidentiality. I mean, if that's all you can get out and then repeat it in yeah. your, lang your second language, you will get things going in the right direction and you can get all of that out like in 10 seconds. Yeah, <laughs> no, I love, love to hear you say that because I'm a huge, huge fan of, of, of Saif as well. And it's so important just to, to clarify, even if it's just 10, 15 seconds, what, what my role is, is here today. Cause I don't know you, your experience working with interpreters. Maybe you, 
maybe you have a lot of experience, maybe you don't. So if I help clarify what my, my role is, then it's always, it's going to be the same, you know, consistent, um, experience, you know, it, it should be a time after time. Um, so that's, that's parents have seen so many specialists come in and out that it's like, they're overwhelmed. So to take that moment out to say what I have to say and repeat it in the language gives them like a wake up call. Oh, this is different. This is not whatever it is, you know, respiratory therapy, nursing. Right. Temperature. Yeah. Why, why is this person here? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, that's, um, well, love, love to hear that. Anyway, we can't, we can't preach that enough. Um, so pivoting, pivoting slightly here. I know you, you, you do trainings all over the, the, the country and you speak at different, different conferences and, um, at different webinars. And so one of the, one of the presentations that, you know, I saw that you did, that I want to ask you about was, uh, how to self assess your skill set, And I wanted, I wanted to ask you, uh, about that for, for us as medical interpreters, what, what should we be thinking about? Where, where do we start there? Well, I do a three-hour workshop called Push Your Performance and the how to self-assess your skill set is a condensed one hour telling you what it is without really letting you do it. Okay. The hour is to practice many different things. I think of interpreting almost like as a diamond, there are many different facets that we can keep polishing. It's not just terminology. It's not just pronunciation in both languages, but there's so much you can do to continually evolve um, how long you can pay attention without having any internal distraction. That's something you can actually learn how to lengthen, mm -hmm. just like you can work on accurate uh, recall in your memory of three to five items, five to seven items, eight to 10 items, you can gradually stretch all of that by setting those stretch goals. Yeah. It's not just focus and attention. It's not just listening skills because if you don't hear it, you're never going to say it. Um, and then it moves past to the actual mechanics of producing converting and producing different rates of speed, uh, different registers. Uh, there's lots of ways, almost like a cat's cradle, to keep working yeah. your skills. And it's an ongoing thing. I tell people once we've shared and practiced in the workshop uh, many of the different exercises that you can do, it doesn't have to be onerous. You don't have to say, okay, now here's the hour a day I've set aside to practice my interpreting yeah. skills and march sadly off to the study. I try to incorporate, incorporate a lot of this practice of the skills and drills aspect into those boring times of day, whether yeah. I'm vacuuming or I'm raking in the yard. It used to be, I used to, drive a lot more and got stuck in traffic well you can always find a talk radio station and put something yeah. on and practice your shadowing or practice your interpreting those moments in the day whether it's commuting time or waiting online or waiting on hold mm -hmm. <laughs> for 30 37 minutes to get your vaccine yeah, um, there are a lot of things you can do to work that practice in and always always finding ways i mean so much so my daughter, when she was 14, 15, and would say, oh, can you pick me up at the mall? And I would say, sure. And she'd say, but don't do that thing that you do in front of my friends, which is when I stop at a red light, just immediately find some talk and start shadowing or start interpreting what the person's doing. I'm not doing anything anyway. I'm just sitting here. So, okay, honey, I won't embarrass you in front of your friends. But you can work it in, and then you feel like everything is always sharp. And what it all rounds back to, all the different exercises, all the different trainings, is that 85, 90% of them are linked to you recording yourself mm -hmm. <laughs> while you do them and then listening to yourself and identifying what gives me trouble. Where do I always get stuck? For me, I know it's numbers and acronyms. So guess what? You take 
note taking workshops yeah. and you learn how to get that stuff down in a reliable way because I don't remember that well. Um, well and or you what you're, what you're what the acronym about. means up front and you write it down for yourself so that every time it comes up later in the in the discussion, even though it's new, you get it right. There are little things you can do to make yourself perform better. Yeah. But it involves being willing to take a good hard look at yourself and a good hard listen to yourself in order to spot what it is that you want to modify. And you don't necessarily have to work on the things that are most challenging. You can take the things that you enjoy or excel at and make them even better. Right. Nothing wrong with doing that either. So there's lots of ways to approach how to change the shape of your on-the-job performance. Yeah. And it never ends. There's never going to be a day when you say you're done. And it's so true. And I, you know, I talk with lot, lots of interpreters and expert trainers like yourself you know, on, on this podcast. And one of the things that, that stands out that I thought about when you were just, just sharing that is sometimes interpreters will, will say, well, you know, there's not a whole lot of, of room for me to grow in this profession, right? Or, you know, but the more time that we're spending, and really what you're, you're talking about is, you know, ultimately time management, right? We all have the same amount of time in the day, right? We all have 24 hours. It's all about how we utilize that time. Are we spending time on our phone or spending time watching TV or Netflix when we could be doing something that's going to help us grow? If we're spending that time, like you said, I mean, I love that. You said, you know, you're, you're in the car, even if you're picking up your daughter, you've got 10 minutes, you're working on shadowing. Why are you doing that? Because you're a pro, because you're an expert and you're taking yourself to the next level. So if we as interpreters embody that mindset, doors will start to open for you because the better you become, you could go more in a direction of training. You could go more in a direction of more simultaneous type, type jobs, uh, entering into a new, a different industry for interpretation. Interpreting for education is starting to blow up yeah. everywhere because yeah. parents are stressed. This remote learning from home, I'm not sure I could teach my own child any math past fifth grade. (laughs) (laughs) They need help and and the PTA and the schools are hearing about it. And guess what? They're coming face to face with the fact that a lot of this has to do with the fact that people can't log on or don't understand that there's multiple platforms for this one class or things that need to be explained or need to be on the website or directions for how to access on your phone because a lot of people are using smartphones to access. Yeah. It's just not as intuitive and needs to be explained to somebody in their first language. So yeah. that's an area where I'm seeing many, many more calls for appointments than ever before. Yeah. And there's, there's opportunities for, for growth in, in our, in our industry and in, in our profession. And, I think it ultimately comes down to what do you want that growth to, to look like? Where do you want to go? And then and setting those setting those goals, setting those smart goals for, for yourself and then having to put in put in the time, put in the work to make sure that you you get there. So you know I am gonna make a pitch for people to get certified. Please do because that's a step up and it's not everywhere, but many, many places will have a pay differential. For certified interpreters, uh, nationally certified interpreters. I live in Washington State, which has mm-hmm. a state level certification yep. through DSHS. And then, so that's one pay grade. And then the national certification gets you up another step, as does a degree in interpreting or translating, which was impossible to get back when I was an undergrad. You had to major in a language. Um, But nowadays, there are multiple programs from East to West Coast that are high quality where you can get a bachelor's or a master's in interpreting or translating. And I don't want to put a big, heavy tuition burden on anyone. But if the idea of getting a degree in this field appeals to you, it's it's inexorably going in that direction. Interpreters are getting younger. There are children now of immigrants who grew up speaking the language as heritage speakers at home rather than the direct immigrants and refugees straight from the country. It's inevitable that if more community colleges offered that associate degree or certificate program, 
that that's going to be available at a very affordable price. And we'll make things happen from there on in. We'll find sponsors. You apply for scholarships. There's grants. There's Mm -hmm. uh, professional organizations that offer scholarships. So I encourage you to pursue this. If this interests you and if you think you're good at it, there's nothing wrong with setting that next goal. Amen. Well, you heard you heard it straight from from Ileana, the the expert trainer herself. So listen, listen to listen to her. I wanted to ask you. Just you do lots of of trainings and you know webinar presentations and things like that. What's the, what's the best way for people to to get in touch with you if someone wanted to ask ask you questions directly or or connect with you? Is that LinkedIn or the best way? Sure. To connect? Um. I'm on LinkedIn and I run a small group on LinkedIn called Seattle Medical Interpreters. I'm on Facebook too. Um, And I also volunteer with the National Council of Interpreting and Healthcare and with the Certification Commissioners for Healthcare Interpreting. Um, Mm -hmm. So the NCIHC website, so if you put NCIHC, webinar in Google. It should get you to the landing page for the webinar series. And scroll down, scroll down, scroll down, because there's like 50 archived webinars. Members have access to all of them for free. And except for the first two, because when we started, we didn't realize we needed to get the approval for uh, continuing education credits, or it was early on in the process enough that they weren't even being issued yet. Hmm. Um, I think 48 of the 50 webinars are eligible for continuing education units for both, um, well, certainly for CCHI and RID, and I think a handful of IMIA, like six or eight of them also offer continuing education credits. And the membership fee is really affordable. If you divide that out by the number of trainings, you know, you're getting each training for a couple of dollars. Um, it is. And, and I want to say would satisfy too. any kind of requirement of yes. 32 credits or more just yeah. from that archive. But the regional organizations like the one in the Northwest is called NOTIS, uh, Northwest Organization no, Northwest Translator and Interpreter Society. Yeah. Yeah. I'm always trying to yeah. figure out acronyms and failing. They offer trainings online and, um, that you can sign up for that offer CEs. Chia offers them too. CCHI offers them too. Um, and if you look in your local area, and if you just do an uh, interpreter organization, Yep. And your state name, you should be able to come up with the regional or state organization and see what they have to offer. Because yep. all of these presentations at conferences, for example, um, and the webinars offered online by the organizations are less expensive in general than taking classes at a college or university. No, that's, uh, that's and it's true. a good way to meet other people locally that work in your field so that you can have a, a group that you can tap and say, you know, I have to, how do you say histocell pingogram in Portuguese, uh, which sometimes is a very different name and sometimes is exactly like it with an O on the end. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, and I have to say too, the, the NCIHC uh, webinars are really, really high quality and there's a great one coming up that I'm, ex- that I'm excited about, two-part series. Second part coming up on January 27th um, in regards to... the Interpreter Rounds one? This is the one in regards to um, managing interpreter services through a public health crisis. Yeah. Very good. So very, very applicable for, for this. So, so, Ileana, one last question for you here is, you know, you've given us lots of golden nuggets today <laughs> that we can all, all be thinking about, things that we can apply to us as, as interpreters or medical providers, um, what is that? What is the one one message that you'd you'd want to leave with uh, with with the community um, today? What is that? What What is the one thing you want people to walk walk away with? 
don't feel alone. I know right now, most of us aren't having the contact with people that we're used to having. And by and large, interpreters are pretty gregarious and we like being with other people and we like helping people. Mm -hmm. And doing it remotely is not nearly as satisfying as having that, you know, peds patient run up and give you a hug when they see you because, you know, mommy is always relaxed when you're here. Hang in there. Join some organizations. There's lots of groups on Facebook, and some of them will even have a happy hour where everyone makes their own drink at home, and they get online and just talk about things in general. Don't lose your connection to the community, because I think we are really feeling that isolation. I know I am, yep. uh, and, and I see um, students every day online, and I am very, very thankful for them. and just being able to see people interacting with their babies and their kids. It's all something that's missing because my kids are all grown up and I get to see it, you know, vicariously yeah. uh, through these zoom and Google and go to and WebEx and Moodle and Canvas so and every platform that I've been on this year, but I'm very grateful to have this interaction and take advantage of the fact that during the pandemic, there are a lot more free offerings. Try a webinar if you haven't done one before or take the risk and, and plunk down your 50 bucks or I'm not sure I'm quoting the right price either uh, for a, a national council membership and open up that archive library of trainings and pick the one that appeals to you the most. Like I said, there's nothing wrong with working on the parts that you enjoy the most. You don't always have to pick the things that give you the most difficulty. It's, it's a tough year. Everyone in my class right now is getting a pass. If you miss an assignment or if it's late, you can redo it. If you don't like your grade on the test, you can take the test again. This is a tough year. I'm giving everyone as much slack to succeed <laughs> as possible. And I want us all to do that for ourselves. Yeah. Be generous to yourself and stay. stay You're connected. worth it. Yeah, the community needs you. That's that's so so true, and you've given us a lot of inspiration today, Ileana. And just like you said, you know, the community does does need great great interpreters who are are committed to the profession and committed to serving the the community. So thank you for for being a real leader and just a language access champion that we all, uh, we all look up to and, um, you know, you, the work that, that you're doing and the trainings that you're doing, uh, are helping advance our profession every day. So, so thank you for your commitment to, uh, to language access and to, um, to us as interpreters and helping everyone just raise, raise the bar. So we, we appreciate you. Thank you for your kind words, David. That means a lot. And thank you everyone for checking this podcast out. I'm sure there's many more interesting ones to come. And for my Brazilian cohort out there, um beijo. Um beijo. If you haven't already, be sure and uh, hit, hit like and subscribe and uh, so you can stay connected and be getting more more content just, just like this. So thanks everyone for, for joining. Ciao, ciao.